Por queso. Por queso. The dip of choice. The questionable dip. Por queso. The questionable dip. <laughs> yeah. That's my favorite dance move. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you don't know if uh, your dance partner is coming back up or not because you may have dropped her. Where you just like drop her and then walk away. Yeah. You're just like, and Whoop, we're time done. To go. It's like a mic drop, but yeah. more permanent. <laughs> Michaela drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, welcome to Dog Ear Discourse, a nerdy little double date where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Each month we're pulling a new and exciting book off our shelves and we've broken them down so you can buddy read with us or just hang out and discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. So a quick recap of where we left off. We're going to uh, need some primary characters here. So we've got, who do we got? We got Schmendrick the wizard. We got Molly. Molly grew. Molly grew. And now we have Lady what was it? Amalthea. Lady Amalthea. So the unicorn was turned into Lady Amalthea. Those are the really big characters so far. Uh, we will be introduced to the king. King Hagrid and Prince Lear. All right, and now it's time for our 60-second recap. Danny, can you give us a 60-second recap of the last half of the book? I'm going to try. Kelly, are you ready with the timer? 60 seconds on the clock. All right. Ready? Mm-hmm. Set. Go. All right. So we got our three amigos, which is the unicorn now turned into a lady, the magician, and Molly. They show up to... Haggard's castle, Haggard's, and they are like, we need to uh, be here, and they have a little sneaky secret that they're keeping, and they do not fool anybody, and King Haggard ends up seeing these 30 seconds. peeps, and he's like, you know what, I don't need my magician anymore, he <laughs> takes on the new magician as his um, entertainer Molly is stuck in the kitchen doing maid stuff, and then he's like, everybody is enamored in love with the 15. unicorn. So the prince that lives there is in love with the unicorn and trying to uh, win her affection, and they're trying to figure out where all the uh, the Five. unicorns are hidden and how to get into the lair of the Red Bull, which is our drink. Eh. Okay, ding 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 ding, <laughs> perfect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I honestly thought somebody was tapping their glass. I was like, damn, that is a good rhythm for ding, glass ding, tapping. Ding, ding. <laughs> Thanks, Danny. That yeah. was a great job. Uh, not quite to the end of the book, but close enough. Yeah, pretty good. I never get close to the end of the book, I feel like. I always get like the first chunk of the story when I say it, and I'm like still missing quite a bit on my synopsis. My brain is like still processing and stuff. It's hard so, to do. Danny yeah. was on the 60 second recap. Yo. Kelly was on the timer. Woo. I'm Chris. And I'm Juan. Today's theme drink is the Red Bull. We have two ounces of raspberry vodka, an ounce of cranberry liqueur, some uh, grenadine, a couple dashes of bitters, and uh, then topped with, mostly topped with tonic, and then a little bit of Red Bull splashed on top. And then the little garnish that looks like a little bowl. Yeah, it looks really pretty. It's so cute. So cheers, everyone. Cheers. cheers. Tink, tink. <laughs> Just smash it and it yeah. breaks. <laughs> and we've aggressive. lost three glasses. Yeah. <laughs> I think my favorite part of this drink was it brought me back to playing NBA jams <laughs> and the Chicago Bulls dynasty in the 90s. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> Ooh. <laughs> okay, so let's, uh, let's go through everybody's predictions about where they thought the book was going and whether or not they were right or not. So my prediction was that they would get to the castle. Check. Haggard is the Red Bull and uh, turns into the Red Bull at night and tries to capture unicorns. Nope, that was wrong. And the unicorns are still alive. Check. Uh, and captured in the dungeon of the castle. Wrong. <laughs> and Molly is going to end up with a prince. I don't remember on... What happened to Molly? I think Molly and Schmendrick ended up together or something. Yeah, that one, they end up traveling together. So, traveling, quote yeah. unquote. <laughs> it's a good story. So, 
Um, Mine was that the Red Bull was the prince, which was wrong, and they team up with the king, which was very wrong. <laughs> Discovered the curse. They're not. They didn't really do that either, and um, they don't really. They kind of find out what happened. Um, and I said I was very pessimistic, and I said that she was the last unicorn, and that was wrong also, but in a good way. I'm really happy that I was wrong about that. All right, Juan, what was yours? Well, I predicted that the unicorn was the last unicorn, and I was incorrect. But I, uh, my prediction that the magician was going to get a bit better turned out to be correct. Correct. Yeah. That was really funny that none of us, well, I don't know about yours, Kelly, but we didn't, I totally like was like, didn't care about the magician. I didn't even say a prediction about him <laughs> at all. <laughs> um, I kind of just clumped the magician in with like the group, but I was, I predicted that the harpy was going to show back up. Um, that the red bull is like a wearable, like a werewolf, but the, but a bull, <laughs> Um, and the king is not going to be what they expected. And then they were going to team up with the king and save the day. And there's going to be at least one other unicorn. Um, in hindsight, that's a very wild prediction and almost none of it was true, (laughs) but there were more than one unicorn. So (laughs) there's that. So yeah, this book definitely had us all guessing like we none of us were really right in any of our predictions usually in the past there at least has been one person that has been right and so this book you couldn't really it's like one of those things where it's like oh you can kind of guess what happens at the end but obviously not us i feel like if you get to a certain point in a book it's there's enough fleshed out that you're like oh okay i i think i see where this is going but if you get to like the halfway mark that's and it's almost like it's almost fun to try to like with very limited knowledge like i i let me try to put this let me try to put a bow on this <laughs> just <clears throat> absent-mindedly or like completely ignorant yeah what's funny is like at, at the halfway point that's when the story actually kind of starts like the first half is like here's the setting here are the characters and go sometimes there's enough to go on but we're not in this one no, on this one, on this one, it was, it was going in weird directions. It was kind of, it was fun to follow along with it. I really liked the writing style. So it was really fun for me to just read, read along with this. And it just, it kept me engaged. And I wasn't, oddly enough, because I enjoyed the writing that, you know, I was reading so much, I wasn't trying to predict too much mm-hmm. about what was about to happen. I was just enjoying the, the words that they were using. I was writing down a bunch of quotes and everything like this is really well written. Yeah. One thing that I really liked that I would never have um, predicted is how stingy the King is like, (laughs) yeah, unbelievable. So the, so we last left off the unicorn had just been turned into a person by the wizard um, in order to get the, red bull off of her trail because he could smell that she was a unicorn he was coming after her bam turned into a human couldn't smell her anymore so kind of just was like well guess my job here is done and like left and so they uh the the unicorn who is now a princess and uh molly and the wizard go up to the castle and the first half the second half of this book kind of leads with a bunch of watch guards in the tower not a bunch. Two watch guards. This is important because I just said how stingy the king is. There are two watch guards <laughs> at the tower, and they're watching For these the whole people. castle. Well, they're watching these people like walk up, and they're just kind of chatting amongst themselves. Like, who the heck are these people coming up? This girl's walking like she's never walked a day in her life, which is hilarious. That was so funny. It was like, yeah, it was. It was like <laughs> she's literally just sprouted legs, like human legs, like a few seconds before that. <laughs> And they could tell. Yeah, it was obvious that she didn't know I what she love was doing. the <laughs> author's description of the like chain mail they're wearing that's like random bits and pieces <laughs> of like rusted metal that's just holding this thing together. Yeah, they're literally like the scrounged armor. together. Uh-huh. The unicorn, who is now a princess, and all, her posse make it up to the castle, and the guards are like, You got to tell us what you're doing here. And they're like, no, we'll tell the king. And so they take him to the king's quarters, which is like just this empty room with like a, a 
chair with cobwebs. Just this like, old, like, foldable <laughs> lawn chair. Yeah. This is my throne. And they're like, yeah, this is not the throne room. This is obviously the dungeons. Like, why are you wasting our time? The wizard is saying this, trying to, like, act all tough. And they're like, how could you say that? And he, like... Like a Scooby Doo villain <laughs> removes his his little garb of like being the watchtower guard and is like, I'm the king. <laughs> and this is my prince. And the prince is the other guard who's like, and I'm the prince. <laughs> Ta -da. And I imagine there was like sparkles and rainbows around yeah. the prince because he's described as like very handsome, very charming, very like excited and like a storybook prince. Yeah. 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 A hero. That that section that like the introduction of the king and the prince as the guards and their like conversation and their like their reaction to seeing the uh, unicorn. It was obvious like both of their reactions to her were obvious from the get go and it followed throughout the whole story basically or the whole second half of the book where they're looking at her and it's like, oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't be so quick to call her a girl or something like that at the very mm -hmm. beginning. And the younger of the two at this time, you don't know who they are. And he's like, I would, I would quicker doubt my own sex than hers. She is a girl. <laughs> yeah. And then the King replies with as well. You may, since you do nothing that becomes, a, that becomes a man, but ride a str uh, straddle. Zing. Yeah. I was like <laughs> roasted. <laughs> but then later you find out, then they start talking about how, uh, I think it was Molly that describes him. She's like, Oh, he, he lost a bit of weight and he's like becoming, a." Uh, uh, like a man like going out and like doing, doing things doing things actually instead of just hanging around the castle playing video games eating potato chips oh yeah so so they so you get to this castle right and they're like hey we we want to like be here and the king's like yeah what do you have to offer and he's like i'm a magician you need a magician and he's like i've already got a magician and he snaps his fingers or something and this magician just shows up out of thin air and he's like i have this magician and Schmendrick's like, yeah, but he doesn't make you happy. So, and and the king's like, you're right, you're fired. And and Prince Lear's just like, come on, old man, I'll give you some references. It's <laughs> like, what the heck? Um, and that is wild. Like, I loved that part of yeah, the... Yeah, that was so cool. You know, yeah. I'm an awesome magician. I can make miracles for you. This guy's a just a hack. And, like, he just kind of shit talks on... Um, on Schmendrick for a little while. And the King's like, eh, you're fired. And he's like, yeah, obviously he's terrible. Yeah. I can, anyone <laughs> could see that that guy's not a magician, but he's better. Like he's right. But you're you boring. Don't, you don't yeah. make me happy. So thank you next. And you're then gone. when it's, uh, his name was Marbrook. 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 If that's how you pronounce that. So he's like, he's not surprised that he just got canned. He's just like, you know what? I'm the real deal. And you just let your doom walk through the front door and I'm not going to be there to save you. And the king's like, meh, you're still boring. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> yeah, I love that part. I was like, that's kind of fun. Yeah. And then they stay there for like a year. They're there yeah. forever. <laughs> so but, the, the book like fast forwards a yeah, they year move in. in like one like between two chapters. Yeah. yeah. So the three of them basically double the size of the king's castle because it was the king the prince and three old guys and that's it yeah, in the whole castle that's that's everybody that's all the servants that's the whole army that's everybody is three old guys yep <laughs> he had uh, he had a line in there somewhere where they asked him about he's like how are you keeping how do you only have these he's like oh i i can make it look like there's a lot more people here so he's obviously like shuffling these guys around to make it seem like he's got an entire army or guards and everything. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, him and his him and his kid also hang out and guard the place, well, which is so in they, shambles. So they have this red bull that also that protects the castle that sleeps underneath the castle. And then also the whole land has been cursed by this witch and it's surrounded by so it's surrounded by eerily prosperous villagers. Except for, so then when you get to the castle, it's like completely dead and like crazy. And so I think that alone, the the fact that they have this like history of being cursed, they have this crazy bull thing, they don't need soldiers. And I think he's just... No one's coming to invade. No. 
Who would want to? Who would want that? <laughs> I think they said that the land itself, most of the land is like just distressed and, and barren, and barren mm-hmm. except around... Is it Haggate? Ha- ha- Hagsgate or whatever it is. Hagates, yeah. Ha- Hagates, the Hagsgate. village. Hagsgate. Those are some weird people that live there. Yeah, that was some weird They're ghosts. They're super paranoid. Yeah. And then uh, Prince Lear decides he's going to like go be all the hero to try and win the favor yeah, of he's, the... he's pouring on the charm thick. Yeah, not only that, he's going and doing a bunch of deeds, which is, like, I'm wondering if someone adds up, like, everything he did, how long were they actually there for? Because the list is pretty long. He's like, I've swum four rivers, each in full flood, and none less than a mile wide. I've climbed seven mountains no one's ever climbed, slept three nights in the marsh of the hanged men, and walked alive out the forest where the flowers burn your eyes and the nightingale sing poison. <laughs> And then he keeps going on. He's like, I've done dragons. I've, uh, I've, I've killed all these knights and stuff like that. And then he goes off to kill an ogre. And, the, and he's like, it's a couple days away. So if you add up just a couple days for each of those events, like, man, he's done a lot. So maybe they've been there a lot longer than just one season. But Yeah. It's, well, he really prides himself on being a hero. And so he's no. doing all these heroic deeds because he wants to win the princess over. And... It has worked before. We've actually seen Prince Lear in the first half of the book. He wants to win um, Lady Amethyst. Lady yeah. Amethyst. Yeah. We're, yeah, we're but calling we... her the princess right now. Okay. Princess Unicorn. Yeah. <laughs> but she is not a princess, but I can understand why we call her Well, just for Lady ease, Unicorn. I can yeah. try to say Lady Amethyst every single time, but that's a mouthful. Yeah. Sometimes I just call her the princess. <laughs> okay. But um, The lady. <laughs> but his heroic deeds have worked before because he was the one that we saw earlier in the book that was having a picnic with some actual princess Mm -hmm. and the unic and they were calling to the unicorn like oh bless our marriage blah 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 and the unicorn just didn't go to them and now and they were betrothed and now that he's met the unicorn as a human he called called off off his engagement (laughs) which is i mean he was he was always oh yeah that was one of the deeds that he did like I've ended my betrothal to the princess and agreed to marry and uh, that I had agreed to marry. And if you don't think that's a heroic deed, you don't know her mother. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. Yeah, that was, I thought it was so interesting. His interaction with Molly, because Molly's in the kitchen cooking soup for everybody. And he is just ranting to her and just unloading all of his problems on her. And she is like, he's writing all these poems to the unicorn to try to win her over. And Molly's like spell checking them and (laughs) she's reading them and she has to listen to him. And as soon as she opens her mouth to try to say, oh, but I also, he's like, no, 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 I don't care. I don't want to know about you. It's too like, I don't know. There's like a a part where he's like, oh, but what about me? I mean, he doesn't even acknowledge that she said anything. No, he he, just runs right over He's not even telling her like, I don't care. He's literally, it's even it's even less than that it's like i i don't even acknowledge her there <laughs> she but, becomes she yeah. becomes the like castle therapist of everyone just comes in and bitches <laughs> yeah. to her or bartender like and it's just like like everybody comes in and then this cat shows up and that's wild but it's like everybody comes in to talk to her about like all their problems mm-hmm. even schmendrick is just like gosh i'm so upset and she's just like here's some food why don't you eat it out mm-hmm That's all she can do at this point. I'm really surprised that she kind of went along because, like, I mean, she definitely is needed in this group, but Mm -hmm. it's just like, what is she getting out of this whole thing? She She just wants to be near the unicorn. Yeah, she wanted to be near the unicorn. Yeah, she was her main thing. Came to her own, too. Like, there's where she says that she begins to care about everyone she feeds. Mm -hmm. So, and she was like slowly becoming, like you said, she was like everybody's (laughs) comfort. Mm-hmm. everybody's going there to not only eat but also just okay. emotionally unload on this poor lady that's just like oh, i hear you you yeah. know it's hard sometimes yeah she's just yeah. busy just chopping potatoes and then <laughs> she will come in and start bitching and, she, and she's just like chopping potatoes she's like i can't go anywhere i'm chopping potatoes <laughs> like no one else is gonna do this shit <laughs> maybe it's because they cornered her and they're like oh you can't leave so i can just bitch to you yeah and she legitimately cares and has responses for them but just don't acknowledge it or listen or yeah she's like i think it's almost comical how much they just don't listen to Mm -hmm. her yeah it paid off for her though because those three old men who were the other guys in the king's employ were kind of just talking about how 
they were like starting to spill the tea on the whole situation oh, yeah. with um the king king haggard and prince lear m- might not actually be related at all which means that prince lear was used to live in hagsgate which means that Prince Lear it could be the one who's destined to take down the whole curse, which the Hagsgate people do not want to happen. So she got to hear it straight from the horse's mouth. And then also ben. that they are prisoners. Yeah. They're like, oh, well, where else would we go? I mean, we're happy here. And they're like, but by the way, we are prisoners. But also we can't leave. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Going back to the stock hopes. Again. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's not that because... They are aware, and they're like, no, we we would leave if we could. Yeah. On the flip side of the Molly having to do the cooking and be there, and she's just being such a great supporting character, we have the unicorn that is just being super vain and selfish. And, I mean, she's not human. She's a horse. (laughs) She's a unicorn, and she does not act human. I mean, she starts to lose her memories a bit. Like, well, a bit. No, she really legitimately starts to lose her memories. But she's a horrible person. She's okay. like well, super emo. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm human. And she doesn't give a shit about anybody. No, but she doesn't do it like that, though, because she doesn't She doesn't realize that she ever wasn't human. Right. I actually have a note about that, and I think it actually ties into some of the stuff that happened in the first half of the book, where it is the indifference of nature. She's not, like, she's not happy about anything. She's not being cruel. Because there is no cruelty in nature. It just is what it is. Like, you kill because you're hungry, Mm -hmm. not because you had to kill. Oh, right. Like, she uh, one time mentions she can't be kind. Yeah, she She can't can't be be unkind. Mm -hmm. Or she can't be cruel. She just is. And that that's exactly the feeling that I got from the way we view her indifference as cruelty. But to her, it's just nature. That's just Just how how she she is. is. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of leaning into the whole unicorn losing her memories, like Danny was talking about, one of the one of the creatures that Molly becomes the therapist for. Well, that's loose. That's that's incorrect. <laughs> one, of the, one of the one of the figures that Molly meets while she's working in the kitchens is this little cat, and this is another callback to earlier in the book, but. They say that the cat purrs prophecy, which they have actually said multiple times in the book. Um, And this time it actually happens where the cat is talking to Molly and she starts laying out like, oh, the unicorn needs to defeat the Red Bull or she's going to forget who she is. In which case she stops becoming magical. I want to start off by saying like exactly like what the cat said to start off the conversation. Molly, you're being stupid. Something along those <laughs> lines. Like the cat was not nice to no, Molly. No, 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 no. The cat was a cat. They say they say it to you like oh, this was definitely a cat. Yeah, and the way that Molly reacts to him, she's like, "Could you always talk, or is this something new?" He's like, "No, I could always talk, <laughs> but I chose not to." Yeah, so you're not worth it, generally. Yeah, but yeah, for for today. Um. So she says the cat, or the cat says the unicorn must defeat the Red Bull, or she will forget who she is. Stop being magical. She says the other unicorns are within sight of her eyes, but almost out of reach of her memory, meaning the unicorns are still around and they're nearby. She says the prince is very brave to love a unicorn. A cat can appreciate valiant absurdity. (laughs) (laughs) It is a little absurd. Um, And also says when the wine drinks itself, when the skull speaks, when the clock strikes the right time, only then will you find the tunnel that leads to the Red Bull's lair. And then the cat kind of gets bored and leaves. The cat's like, I know how to do it, and I know where everything is, but I got to go take a nap in the sun, so bye. Yeah. But I am a cat, and no cat anywhere ever gave anyone a straight answer. Yeah, when she's like, why do you talk in riddles? Yeah. He's like, well, how else? Like, also, how it's, was like, it's like the cat playing with the mouse that's like half yeah. dead, and he's just like, are you still interested? <laughs> do you want more information? Come on. Come on. I know you do. Then Mouse like, twitches. Nah. <laughs> I thought it was really funny how they spelled meow. It was M I A O W. Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, I, I was like, t- "What the heck is oh, that?" that? That's the old timey spelling for meow. Back is in like it? Shakespeare day, that's how they meow. spell it because they didn't, you know, they hadn't this interacted is not with Shakespeare enough cats. Days. No, 
This is, I looked it up because there are a lot of similarities between Alice in Wonderland and this book. Yeah. The cat being one right, of them. Right. But Alice in Wonderland was written in 1865 and this one was written in 1968. So about a hundred years difference. Definitely not Shakespeare. Yeah, I think Alice in Wonderland definitely paved the way for quite a few stereotypes and like, I don't know, just kind of like themes in general, Mm -hmm. because I feel like that quote that I read about the the cat speaking, like basically never giving a straight answer and how we all can recognize in multiple films and books that they do talk in riddles talking about the movie mirror mask again, where like (laughs) literally they cannot pass. He's like, you shall not pass. And they're like, what are you talking about? It's like, answer the riddle. And it's literally that you have to talk to this freaking cat and answer a riddle or give him a riddle to pass by him because he's a guard. And it's just there's so many instances of that. Mm-hmm. It's like, so I think, yeah, Lewis Carroll. Mm. Well, and there's like through the looking glass, through the clock, through the mm-hmm. through the regular object. But if you go past it, there's something more mysterious. I like that a lot. Mm-hmm. It's like a secret passage, which I'm always a huge fan of. Did you know that the Egyptian word, the, there's a, an Egyptian cat called the Mao? And so no. th- it, it makes me think of things like an Egyptian would see a cat for the first time. Like, what are you? Mao. Okay, Aww. fair enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what you shall be called. Right. Like, I think I saw a Tumblr spoken. post like that or something. I'm like, all right, well, I guess that's a Mao. <laughs> <laughs> um. The cat had mentioned that as Lady Amalthea starts to lose her memory of being a unicorn, that's when, like, her magic stops being, pretty much. Um, And one thing that I noticed about this half of the book is that we talk about eyes a lot. Um, When the king first meets her, her whole group, really, but he's, like, looking deeply into everybody's eyes, and he's like, oh, okay, I see a little bit of myself in you molly and he looks at the wizard and he's like i see a little bit of myself in you too although you're pretty stupid (sighs) and then he gets to the unicorn and but she's not a unicorn she's lady amalthea and he looks in her eyes and is like staggers backwards and is like what is wrong with her eyes they're green like there's leaves and like life in them like forest animals forest, yeah. yeah yeah, yeah. I was, yeah. I was tell so me about crazy. the leaves and the foxes or something like that yeah, yeah. it's like and i cannot see myself in you and as the story is going and as she's living her life on two feet and falling in love with Prince Lear and the green leaves in her eyes start to fade away and are just replaced with humanity. And as that starts to fade, so in the beginning they hear this rumbling throughout the castle. Mm-hmm. And any time that... It's like any mention of or any time that she gets this like memory of her being a unicorn, there is a rumbling throughout the castle that happens happens less and less less as as that that fades fades from her eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bull realizes that the there's less presence of a unicorn nearby. So he's not as worried. Yeah, he can sense when she's remembering her unicornness and it wakes him up because his whole goal in life is pretty much to hunt down the unicorns because I'm not okay. I was collect, little, collect them. Yeah. It was a it little was unclear whatever. to me because he, um, the Prince Lear goes off and is slaying a dragon or fighting an ogre or something for Lady Amalthea. And so he's off and she's standing on top of the castle waiting for him to come back. And she sees him coming back, singing a little song of, heroism or whatever and the king kind of comes up behind her and like lays down all of this it was basically just an explanation of what actually happened which i was i would actually be interested in what you thought about that whole Mm. exchange danny but um he basically says he knows she's the unicorn he's definitely not related to lear he trapped the unicorns here and that the bull, he doesn't own the bull, but the bull knows that he wants all of the unicorns and that the unicorns are the only thing that might bring him joy. So the bull, bull's only goal right now is to go out and get the unicorns. And I was a little unclear about what would drive the bull to even care what the king thinks. I think Did the bull just shows 
I think the bull just chose the king. I think you mentioned something about how the the bull chose its master like based on fear or something like. Uh, oh yeah, because like he, he didn't have any fear of yeah. him. Right. Uh-huh. Yeah, because yeah, he doesn't have any fear. Yeah. So the king doesn't have any fear of the bull, and so that's right. why the bull found him worthy. Yeah, and, and, and he doesn't have any fear of anything. So then the bull's like sole purpose was basically to find whatever it was that he wanted and bring it to him, but he like didn't want anything. As a reward for being, he, yeah, he was he was haggard, haggard the minimalist. Yeah, he wants. <laughs> he, the only thing he was afraid of was spending some coin. Yeah, <laughs> like he, oh, he uh, didn't even. Have, he, that's how that's how cheap he was. He didn't even have to spend it. The bull got to get him. He's like, mm, nah, we're good. I have I have a whole army of three. What else? <laughs> yeah, I got at least three dudes. I've got three least. elderly guys. What They're else do you need? Seventy yeah. years old, but we got them. <laughs> And, and Haggard know. also tells, like, right then where the unicorns are. Like, he tells the unicorn. He's like, out, like yeah, out the window. He's like, look, you can see them. They're and in the waves. Like, she looks and she doesn't see them. I think that she did see them at first. And when then, she first got to the castle, she spent a lot of time just staring out the window at the waves. Mm-hmm. But as she starts to forget, and as the bull stops roaring all the time, she looks out at the waves and she just sees waves. And then at the very end of that conversation, she has totally forgotten who she is. It was at that point, mm-hmm. like they mentioned that she, she's like, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. It was like, oh. Yeah. So, Danny, you have said in previous episodes that you had a low opinion about um, basically like plot dumps, mm. which is what this felt like it was a little yeah. bit. I, yeah, I guess like it did kind of annoy me that that whole thing had happened. So in this half of the book, the story of what was actually happening kind of happened to our characters individually. So <clears throat> um, Smedrick, the magician, told Molly that he thinks that the king knows all, that he he understands what ha- what's happening and he's just kind of like letting it ride out. And then Molly learns about what's going on a little bit by Smedrick and then also by the other guards, whereas the unicorn is just chilling, you know, parading around with the prince, like not really doing anything this whole time. And so there really wasn't a good opportunity for her to learn what was going on because they didn't fill her in on the plan on like what the cat said, what they needed to do. I I felt like, so the only, I felt like it was just a convenient thing for the king to, and to like come up to her and and spill the, spill some truth. But also over a year they've been here. So I'm sure the king was kind of eager for some more plot, the plot to move along as well. So he's like, listen, Linda, I know who you are. And then at this point, he's kind of, you know, he's too late. Yeah, it felt almost like a Bond villain telling Bond his, like, master plan because he knows there's nothing that they can do about it, right? But for a minute, he thought that she was in on the plan because he was like, oh, you're going to steal the bull away from me, which I don't know how she would possibly do that. But, and she's like, why would I want a bull? I don't have a castle. What do bulls even eat? <laughs> and he's like, no way. It's like, he no, loses it. don't you see? Yeah. I think that I thought that was actually really funny. Cause I was like, Oh, you are right, but it's too late. <laughs> but yeah. So yeah, I definitely was like kind of irked by that, but I was like, I didn't see another opportunity where she could have been brought up to speed, I guess. And also it confirmed Smedrick's, suspicion that the king knew what was going on he was just letting these people parade around and cook for him and stuff like that i also think because he knew she was a unicorn that he wanted to add her to his collection but maybe now that she was in human form he was like yeah that was a cool trick that you pulled how did you pull that off like how did you turn into a human and she's like what are you talking about i've always been a human yeah (laughs) he's like that's clearly untrue yeah and they're like everybody is like the magician couldn't do gestures to her whole body yeah yeah. they're they're like look at mendrick they're like yeah no, not that guy. <laughs> How did you do it? <laughs> this guy's a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, I'm standing right here. Yeah, you, you are a joke. <laughs> yeah. And he like pulls a rabbit out of a hat. And yeah, like, yeah, we understand. He's you got the, he's got yeah, the flower that Yeah, we saw you put that, that in there in the, the first place. <laughs> he's got that flower that just squirts them in the face with water. <laughs> He's got one of those little tin cans and you take the top off and a snake pops out. 
my god. Like, like I've done the endless like scarves out of the thing that, that didn't impress you. No, we you know you stuffed them in there. They're very tiny. <laughs> very tiny. <laughs> but, uh, He's but, just walking away like shoulder slump just cards falling out of his sleeves and coins <laughs> rolling out of his shoes so he was he was with um in the first half of the book he was with the um, night circus people and he was exhausted then because he knew all that he could do was just play tricks and you know do sleight of hand and basically lie to people and that's exactly what he got hired to do here at the castle and now he's really exhausted because he's like god Damn it. <laughs> Back and, to basics. Yeah. And at least with the traveling circus, there was this air that people thought that he was like an actual magician. Whereas now like he knows he's like the king knows that he can't do shit. So he's just and he's like. he's still calling on him to be like, do the card trick again. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? Do yeah. it again. So he's getting pretty frustrated. And so then they, 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 so then they take off, and they, uh, Schmendrick and Molly are now searching. Now that the cat's given the prophecy of like how to how to solve this puzzle, mm-hmm. they they start going in. They're like, okay, we gotta find this wine. Yeah, we gotta find the skull, find the wine that drinks itself. I haven't seen any wine. Have you seen any wine? And they're like, there's no wine in the entire dang castle. Why does the king know everything? Why does the king? have such a weird thing going on with the time and there he doesn't allow lights and he can sense what magic is, like real magic is and he can see the forest in the unicorn's eyes is it because of the curse that's put on the castle or is he some weird magician person himself you know i th- uh, to me i got the feeling that he was so disinterested in anything and there was so little of that occupying his mind that he was able to discern between basically anything. And I think there was just so little he he wanted for nothing. So none of that occupied his mind. He he wasn't like, oh, what should I have for dinner tonight? He's like, I know what I'm having: bread and water. Yeah, Ooh, he wanted done. no no flavorful food at all. Just because yeah. he's like, that's a waste of money. <laughs> so th- all of that processing power, I think, just was him looking for something that he might be interested in and giving. Like one of my one of the lines that I had uh, written down uh, for him, one of the quotes is something along the lines uh, they mention about him having like a feast or why why do you live like a pauper? You're a king. He's like, oh, I've I've known them all and none make me happy. I will keep nothing near me that does not make me happy. So I think he just he literally gives nothing a second in his mind if it isn't going to bring him joy so the things that he he's a minimalist yeah he's a, <laughs> yeah does this bring you joy he no, you're the throw minimalist. It <laughs> so I, I think he's just he can just pick up on because he's always searching for those things that bring him joy it was like maybe that's what there's nothing in his mind that's like that's ultra occupying. analytical yeah okay what do you guys think I didn't give it a second thought, honestly. I just figured it was part of the magic of whatever's going on here. Mm. So probably the magic cursed castle or whatever. Like he's cursed to see things for what they truly are. And um, I wrote that down as a big theme of seeing something for what it truly is. And I feel like if you see something for what it truly is, you lose interest in it, right? Mm. So there's no magic in it because you've seen it for what it truly is. So there's no curiosity of the thing, right? If I see this book and I I see it for what it truly is, as in I know everything about that book, there's no reason for me to pick up the book or want it, right? If I know everything there is to know about this pen and like when it's going to run out of ink and all that stuff, you lose curiosity in the world. And so maybe he can just see things what, for what they truly are, and that's why he's not happy. And that was actually that's touches up on... Yeah, that was that touches up on something that I was thinking of during that time was how do you keep interest in something that brings you joy after using it or that item or that thing after seeing it for so many times? How do you still maintain the joy in seeing it? Because like you said, if you look at something for what it is and nothing more like he is, Damn, he is not deep. <laughs> no, but he's he's not looking for the magic in it. He's like this thing shouldn't like this thing should make me feel something but he's not looking to feel something he's like whatever this thing is if it doesn't bring me he's not he's not looking 
for what makes something special. He's like, if you don't make me feel a certain way, then you mean nothing to me. Versus him, like a, like in uh, the Lear, I feel like almost took it. He's like over romanticizing how he felt about uh, Lady Unicorn. But they they take like separate approaches to him. Where I feel the king is like, he's almost uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? He's being almost like reductionist. He's like this is only this thing instead of he's like, Oh, that's, that's a tree. Instead of seeing this thing that has grown for hundreds of years and may have seen and experienced all of these things. And it's wrapped up and it's, and it's in the rings inside of this thing and all the experiences that it lived in, it cannot tell anyone. He's just like, that's lumber. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah. That's all I got for Haggard. <clears throat> so then he is a joyless piece of shit <laughs> because so that kind of goes into also so like the king is all knowing he's he knows what they're they're planning but he lets it all happen so then they're touring the castle looking for this 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 um entrance to go visit the bull and they get in a situation where they're they find the skull they find that skull found a skull yep check yep. that check Ching. They do not find any wine, and and they're like, okay, well, let's just let's just try the skull thing out first, one thing and at a time. Just like the cat, like it took a while of them trying to talk to it and get mad at it and stuff. Yeah, I love the I love the skull's attitude towards everything. He's just mischievous and like annoying on purpose. Nope. Like, oh, I go nah. So yeah, yeah the, the skull starts to talk and yeah, it's it only great. after um, Spendrick was like skull. angry at it and he's like, hey, 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 I made you angry. <laughs> and so they're like, what the heck? He's like, I'm a skull on a shelf. What else do you expect? Do you think I'm just going to not have fun? He's like, you know how boring it is being a skull on a shelf? Yeah. yeah and he's like, there's riddles that you need to unfold to, to get to the Red Bull. And they're like, okay, we'll answer the riddle then. Tell us how to get there. And he's like, No. delightful and then and then so like schmendrick like fakes out that he's got some wine right and the 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 little skull's like i just want some wine give me some wine give me that wine and so it was like it was a trick right and um he's like drinking nothing just air and he's like and it's like oh that's so good and then it opens up the pathway to the bull right Oh no! He he tells them to go through to the go clock. through the clock, and they're like, "But what time do we go through it?" And he's like, "Time doesn't matter." And they're like, "But the cat said." And he's like, "It doesn't really matter." Like, no, but what time is it? They like do not take him seriously. He's like, "It doesn't it's matter." It's a cat. <laughs> you're taking advice from a cat, and now you're trying to get advice from a talking skull. You so, guys need better <laughs> confidants, yeah. right? And then the, then the skull's like, oh, yeah, you guys should probably destroy me. Well, because this whole time while they're arguing with the skull about whether or not they're going to get information, you can hear the, the the three old guards running around trying to find them. Like, they're trying to hunt down Schmendrick and Molly and the unicorn. And so they're talking to the skull with, like, growing impatience, like, we got to we gotta go, go. like <laughs> just no tell us the this. way to go we'll do anything here's your wine blah 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 and the, the and the skull is like okay well you just got to go through the clock nothing else i can tell you and also you should probably destroy me that's probably part of the prophecy and they're like that's not part just, of the prophecy just pick me up and smash me and they're like no we could never it's like well okay your funeral it's like they're down here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like immediately. It was like, they're right here. It's like, I told you, you should have smashed me. Yeah. But then he notices the unicorn and he yells even louder. He's like, no, the unicorn is right here. Woo, woo. Set yeah. off the alarms. Woo, <laughs> woo. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, like I know, Chris, you had mentioned the first half of the book that this this book is hilarious, but it, it's like, it's such a weird concept for us to read some things that was written so beautifully. And then to have these like random bouts of like humor in it. And that was like really funny to me. The whole skull <laughs> interaction thing was hilarious and how like what a drunk he was that he actually drank like invisible wine, basically like yeah. an, an empty dry bottle that um, reminded me of something that I totally forgot about that happened earlier um so uh, 
that I thought was hilarious and just so random. So the prince is trying to do all these crazy things to impress the unicorn. And one of those times, um, he needs to go like defeat um, this ogre. And he's like, it is said that he can be slain only by the one who wields the great axe of Duke Albin. Unfortunately, Duke Albin himself was one of the first consumed. He was dressed as a village maiden at the time to deceive the monster. And there is little doubt who holds the great axe now. If I do not return, think of me. Farewell. And then he's like so dramatic. But I was like dying laughing at that part. I was like, what? <laughs> you know, dressed as a maiden. <laughs> I love the idea that this guy went down there to like slay this ogre. Yeah. And he's like, all right, I got a plan. I'll be like, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> just immediately gets consumed. And then like the prince just says it like it's fact. And then like, I mean, obviously it was, but then, then he's like, then he's so dramatic himself. And he's like, oh, but think of me. If I don't return, farewell, maidens. I'm just imagining this big, <laughs> this big guy with a big beard and like the old school, like, princess attire with yes. the, the big cone hat and like the <laughs> yeah, streamers the off streamers. of it and like his belly like tufts of hair the popping out of the top yeah <laughs> oh. so yeah but like that was that part made me laugh so hard and that was like that reminded me when we were at the school i was like the school like can you help us no <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway it was, it was pretty great he's <laughs> having a grand old time just yeah so then people. they walk through they take Narnia. Yeah, they, they like they like take uh like Lear, Prince the Lear. The looking glass, the wardrobe, the clock. Yep. Yeah. So everybody like shows up. Prince Lear's there. Princess is there. And they he all go through the clock. He is randomly there. He just shows up. He's like, "Hey, I'm here too. What's going on?" Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did just kind of pop out of nowhere. Yeah. Huh? He literally just followed them into the clock. He's like, "Well, I I've guess this is where I'm going." Here. Hmm. Has this door always been here? <laughs> I, I I literally wrote down Prince Lear is there. Schmendrick shows up. <laughs> Like all of a sudden, like all these people, like oh, I forgot to write in the fact that they these guys are here. So okay. I'm just gonna write that in. Now. Yeah, right back to Scooby Doo, where everybody runs into the same room. Like, hey, hey! So yeah. From and different then, directions, and then but there's just, only one door. <laughs> yeah, and then Haggard just destroys the clock. Yeah, like as soon as all of them are through the clock, he's just like, eh. Good He's luck. like, perfect. You went right where I wanted you with the Red Bull, whose whole mission is to capture the unicorn. Cool. Now you're not escaping. Mm-hmm. Da, 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 boss fight it was it, it, did, it, it did. freaking was and it, the hero was not who you would have thought oh maybe that's where they got that thing from elden ring where you like step through the fog it's like you're stepping into the clock yeah and then it's like mm-hmm. boss fight mm-hmm. you have died wait no that's prince lear later yep <laughs> so i have a, i have a quote that was from such Haggard. a sad pathetic scene it was like under a sentence honestly it was like three words and then it moved on Oh, I got some good notes on that. Uh, anyway, go ahead, Vaughn. Where he's talking to the unicorn about feeling joy and why he's doing this, our little plot dump. But w- one thing he says is how we re- regarding how we felt. I'm sure it was joy. The first time I felt it, I thought I was going to die. I was dying laughing when I read that. <laughs> this guy's like, oh, God, my heart. He, can't, he doesn't even know what it is. And it's like, I felt too much something. For him. And so, therefore, it must be what I conceive of as joy. That was when that was when he first saw a unicorn, right? Yeah. yeah. That was yeah, when, he was, when, he was when King re-nodding. Haggard first saw a unicorn. That was when he yeah. actually felt something. And because he felt anything, it was like, must be joy. He's like, <laughs> I must be dying. The, sir, I don't know how to tell you this, but. Dying of happiness. <laughs> that's normal. Yeah. You should feel that normally. <laughs> This should come and go occasionally. You're not dying. Dude, this king had some issues, man. I, I think he had whole subscriptions. <laughs> so, so like, they're, they're at this boss fight, right? The boss fight with the bull. And this was an Elden Ring boss fight. It, it so was. It was, yeah. like, one of those, um, yeah, it was a Souls game boss you fight. You died. Yeah, and then the bull just starts trouncing out of nowhere, and just like you, you have this cut scene where the bull shows up. It's on a beach, and there's like the waves that are crashing around, and then there's like these like unicorns going. <laughs> <laughs> Schmendrick talking up terrified. Prince Lear, giving him all this confidence. And he's like, "You're right, a hero act." The then unicorn like, Glacia starts playing. Right? Oh my god, no! The unicorn <laughs> is like. No, uh, we should just have a, we should get married and just have a happily ever after. And the prince is like, I'm a hero. I don't, in this situation, I don't get a happily ever after. And Schmendrick slides in is like, that's right. A hero (laughs) would fight this battle for us. And you are definitely the one to do it. (laughs) 
such a crazy. Oh my god! Even Molly was like, "That was fucked up, dude." Yeah. <laughs> Very dude, shady, sir. Mendrick has big bard energy. Yeah. Was my take from this whole thing, and I know I, I meant to ask you guys about this, but it was to me it is like this is why I don't know if hate is the right word, but despise maybe. Anytime I, anytime there's bard energy in the room, I'm like, I'm out. I'm really? like, this guy's gonna bust out a lute and start singing, and it's only for his benefit. And this is like, like he he is ridiculed. People people will spit on him, and he's like, but I have a plan. I'm gonna get ahead somehow. Like, and then yeah, he, he's immortal he, until he doesn't figure out until yeah, he figures but out then his life. He saw this this poor. This guy is in love. Yeah. And all he wants to do is defend her honor. And he's like, you you should. You should definitely do that. This guy takes a sword out of his sheath and then gets no. immediately trampled by something. He doesn't. No, he yeah, holds no. his hands out in front of him <laughs> like he's holding a sword, but he's empty handed. Yeah. It yeah. says it worse. broke. It yeah. broke earlier. Yeah. So he's literally like, he's, he's in the hero stance. But he has none of the hero gear. Yeah. He's just he ready ex- to defend. He felt exactly what our Prince Albin from earlier felt when the ogre got him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, chomp. He's like, yeah. but the Axe, thing is, check made an outfit. Check. Oh, oh shit. Oh. <laughs> so, so the funny thing is, like Prince Lear stands between the bull and the unicorn, promptly gets trampled once, gets up. Right, and then gets trampled a second time and dies. <laughs> they back the bus up on him. <laughs> oh god! And it was like a sentence, and then they move yeah. on with the story. I mean, it was a significant act, but I was like, oh god! I had to listen to him writing stanzas and like all these poems, just and to get he, trampled by a bull. And he just got trampled by a bull in under a sentence, and I'm like, come on now, I really? Mean, Robin Hood could have at least shown back up, uh, but yeah, it worked out for Schmendrick though because. Um, Prince Lear's acts of courage inspired Schmendrick to like actually get his power and in a way that he knew was re-accessible, like he would be able to repeat this kind of thing, which was the problem that he's been having is he can do one or two one-offs and then he can never do it again because he doesn't know what he did. But then watching watching, watching the bull get- just run back and forth over the body... <laughs> Just, <laughs> just plowing. Just, just like, making this guy into salsa. Steamrolling <laughs> this prince. He's like, huh, well, that was brave. I yeah. should be a magician. And, and he, he does. He, was, he, he, does. he, it, he whips out the magic and is like, turns, it back turns her back into a unicorn. And she watches the horror that's happening and lets out the uh, a scream like no more immortal creature has ever done because now she has... The horrors of... She's dual wielding. Yeah, she has the horrors of mortality on her shoulders, too. And that gives her the power to fight the bull. Her human side did love the prince because he was all that she knew. Because she was literally born there at the castle as a human. And when your choices are prince or schmendrick <laughs> or king yeah. like or or the 70 year old guards it's like oh prince. and he was laying it on thick right in her poems and stuff so she was just like oh this must be what love is sure okay but what is love? I know what love is. and not only was he pouring it on thick when she rejected him he's like that's okay, okay. too man you do you he's like <laughs> if you if if my if my if i'm being reproached then I have to accept that. He even like, wrote a song, and in the song he was like, I'll tell you I love you, but you and never ask for you to say it in return or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. so she, she she cared for him, though. Yeah. And she, I think she actually ended up saying that she loved him, even if she didn't really know what that meant. But um, So yeah, so she turns her ass around, and she's like, oh, fuck no. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's my boo. And so then she tramples over to the Red Bull and they have like this standoff thing. And he's like not he's like not in his preferred terrain. He's like in um, sand right now and he's sliding around. Well, and, and he's not used to things standing up to him. So he's right? like really unsure what to do because he's used to chasing. He's also the- blind. So. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that too. Yeah. And so like unicorns showing up and and he's like, wait, wait. Wait, you're supposed to run away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jesus, no. So yeah, she stands her ground, and I think he's just like, oh, uh, okay, bye. <laughs> so he just like walks off into the sunset. In the he water. walks into the ocean. <laughs> yeah. He just walks into the ocean. I was, 
he runs away. He has the fight or flight response and he got spooked enough where he's like, bye. Yeah. <laughs> like, and then all of the unicorns, which have been stuck in the sea because they were afraid of the uh, bull, leave the sea because they're still afraid of the bull. And now that bull's there. <laughs> so they're free now. Yep. yep. And so they wash over the land and run yeah. off into the sunset. Now that she's in her unicorn body again, she can re resurrect, reanimate the prince. <laughs> Yeah, she just goes up to it, bing, you're alive. Yeah. No, she double taps. Mm-hmm. Right? She was, yeah. Brings it back to life. She and didn't then, think about it, though. She had a second And then, then touched him <laughs> a second. Yeah, because the, the first one was to bring him back to life, and the second one was for her, was yeah. what she said. It was for pleasure. Business yeah. and pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to bring gotta bring the princely person back to life, and then, ooh, I want to touch you with my horn. Wow. Magical. Could have said she's horny. <laughs> oh, my God. Horny for the prince. <laughs> Rule two, double tap. Double tap. <laughs> so yeah, so Lear and once is now like, oh yeah, once once the Red Bull's been defeated, castle gone, just disappears, and you like literally have the the king up in his little tower, and the, the castle disappears, and he just ah thunk and dies. It was great, much. but he doesn't scream; he laughs. Oh yeah, that's right. He laughs on the way down. He's, He's like, totally not even surprised. He's like, of course, of course, is the way it goes. Another boring thing to happen, falling to my death. <laughs> no, because he, no, he, he found that amusing. He, 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 yeah, he found that amusing. He, it, it brought this him joy. This must be joy. <laughs> oh, I would God. love to bring this guy to like Disneyland or something <laughs> oh like that and God. just see his. He's just like no. straight faced, like going along like the, the roller coaster with like uh, the cotton candy and stuff like that. And just like nothing. He's got the ears, cotton candy, <laughs> splash mountain, just like. Mm. Yeah. Like, Bull oh. Whip! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. That's us. It's like when you're that's, introducing your Disneyland, cat actually. to new treats and you're like, do you like this one? <laughs> Sniffs it. Like, no. Walks away. Nope. Do you like this one? No. And then you give them one that they actually like. They're like, this is it. This is the thing. You have changed my cat life. <laughs> All nine of my lives are dedicated to this <laughs> one thing. They're like opening up drawers trying to find, <laughs> like break into the snacks. <laughs> Yeah, and so then the book kind of wraps up. So the, the prince has to be king, yeah, and yeah. he doesn't really like it. He wants to just run after the horse, I mean the unicorn, but she's now with horn. among her people. Yeah, she's she's out gallivanting around. Uh, I like the... He's touring. Yeah, he's just going on tour. The one, si- the one town that was really prosperous, all of it just crumbles, which was great. It's like, that yeah, your whole town got trampled. By unicorns. Like, yeah. Really? He thought it was a nor'easter or something. It's like, <laughs> yeah. nope. Like an earthquake or something. Yeah. And they, they can't be, ha- they're like super happy about it too. They're like, yay, it's done. So. But yeah, it, now it's make definitely the like relief village. of tension. Yeah. They were like, the magician can do it. The magician can make us a new village. I like, I could. He's like, but you guys suck, so I'm not going to. <laughs> boop, boop, boop. Tried to have me assassinated, if you remember. <laughs> that was some fine wine, though. <laughs> he drank all their wine. <laughs> <laughs> he did get better about not drinking wine because the, yeah, the castle didn't have any. He so was forced to sober, sober up. Forced sobriety. Yeah. All so, right, so oh. what do you think? Did you guys like the, the first half of the book or the second half of the book better or overall thoughts? I liked overall the whole book. I thought it was fun. It was well done. Kept me guessing as to what was going to happen. Even though I've seen the movie way back in the day, I didn't remember any of it. Um, And I really, really liked the writing style. Like I was really drawn to the flow of this writing. It makes me want to read more of his books. I'm wondering if they're they're the same way. Mm, Probably. Yeah, I actually thought the same thing too about reading other books and seeing if this was a writing style only for this book or if he writes his other books like that. Cause I've, I felt the same way. It was like, I would read just like even separate from the story, just reading bits and pieces of it as like, it's, it almost reads like poetry or riddles where you're looking at it and you're like, let me reread that because I feel like I didn't get the full meaning of, of whatever it was. And sure enough, sometimes you reread something like, oh, okay, I see that there's, you know, whether it's like wordplay or some kind of like metaphor or whatever the case is. Or sometimes you reread it and you're like, oh, damn, this guy got roasted. <laughs> like he didn't even know about it. 
I think I like the first half a bit better just because they were traveling and I'm a big fan of that. Like I like my favorite books are ones where they're like meandering streams, like going all over the place. And they definitely did in the first half of the book, whereas in the second half they were just at the castle. I felt like in the other books that we had read as a podcast together, the second half is the action half. And so for the previous books, I'm like, wow, this is where like a lot of stuff happened and you learn a lot more of what's going on. And, and I feel like all of us kind of like the second half of the books, the previous books that we have read. But in this case, there wasn't really that much going on. I mean, there was like the boss fight, but I felt like there was more going on in the first half that was like interesting to me. Um, like because they had traveled to different towns and little quirky things happened in each of those places. So I felt like this is probably one of the exceptions like that we've of the books that we read. Like is this one of the first books that I like the first half better than the last half. Kelly? This one is kind of told in snippets, I feel like. So there was the little part with the butterfly. And then there was the little part with the traveling circus. And there was a little part with the bullfight. And there's just like a bunch of stories that were segmented together almost, I felt like. Mm. And so there were certain segments that I liked. Like, I liked the part with the traveling circus a lot, the yeah. menagerie. Um, I liked a lot of the characters in the second half, like the little side characters that were really funny, like the cat and the skull. Oh, yeah. Um, pretty funny. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of liked... The part where they're drinking all the wine and learning about the curse from the first half. So I don't know. It was, I liked it overall is like a, as a fun action packed adventure Mm -hmm. that uh, didn't have like, it felt action packed when I got to the end, but now that I'm thinking back on it, it wasn't terribly action packed. It was just really well told. Yeah. And it's a short book too. So there's not a lot of downtime. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so what would you give the ra- rating this book out of five stars? Only whole stars, please. Five out of five. Delightful all the way through. There wasn't a part that I didn't like. I would agree also. Five out of five. I I would I would reread the book. Like I said, uh, it's not even... Uh, like, I, I understand the story. It's a short book, but just to reread like find out what it is that I missed because I know there's definitely more there. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, yeah, it was, I I loved how concise the story is and also all the little like side characters or like the meandering within the story of like these little details or whatever, the little jokes that you might miss. All of it was good. I would give it, I think a four. I might read it again. Get off the Island. Um, but I mean, it was it was definitely enjoyable. But I think I my five star reads are ones that I feel like one are a lot bigger. Like a lot, there a lot more happens and a lot more detailed, and they, there's a lot more to the story. I guess I don't, I don't know. I felt like this was a really good like um, fairy tale, and I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad that we read it together. And I might read it again because I you know once in a while, but it's not one of my favorites. So. Okay. Why? I I would go five out of five on this one. I will reread this book. Um I like the writing style that much. Yeah. I like now I I know the story and everything, but I, I really was latched on to just how eloquent it was and how he told a lot, like the unicorn moved like water. Right? It's it's those kind of metaphors that they're using that just really drew me to the writing style. And I know that I love that about you know reading books so if if a book isn't written well enough then as in like the the alliteration within the book is not good or the you know the sentence flow isn't working for me it will tank a book for me like even if it's a really well-developed world and all that but this a short nice fairy tale that's told very very well um so yeah five out of five for me i want to go back and reread it just because um, by the end, I was catching a lot of things that I happened to remember from the beginning, like the purring prophecy. I was like, that sounds, I feel like I've heard that phrase before. So I went mm. back and I had, um, and I'm curious as to how many other instances of that, like you're saying the unicorn moved like water was from pretty early on in the book. And then guess what happens? 
the unicorns are trapped in the water. Like oh, I'm yeah. so interested to see how much continuity there really was that I just couldn't have known. Yeah, I think I definitely need to read it again because I felt like I was more focused on the characters and the action that I did appreciate the language and but I kind of was like kind of skipping over it a bit just because I was so focused on what is going on. Um, but yeah, I definitely love how like the book was written and it kind of I don't think I've read a lot of books that were written so well that I just don't really recognize it. And I I have read books that are very like they're described as flowery language where they describe things and sentences of multiple, I don't know, like um, adjectives that are just kind of strange and um, like Lainey Taylor, um, Strange a Dreamer is like what comes to mind, a very good example of that, um, where it's like very strange how she describes something and it's so in depth, but it's very flowery that some people can probably be like put off by it, where I felt like this wasn't flowery and fluffy at all. It was like very to the point with its descriptions of it things, was, but it's beautifully written in yeah. that way. And that I think is the main attraction for me was how concise it was with these grand concepts. So some of the, like, I think the very first thing that struck me from the book was where the unicorn is like dancing around this guy that's trying to capture her. And she's like, what would you even do if you caught me? Like mm -hmm. something, just this little line where you're like, why, why are you trying to capture her? Why would, what would you even do if you did? And, and like, she knows that she's, she's like, how silly of you to pursue something that like the reason that you want to capture me is because you can't. And if you did, what meaning would your life have then? She even had the attitude towards the prince too. She's like, right. oh, he just wants me and not like my opinions. He's not asking me my opinions on things. Right. And and it was just those little little things like that sprinkled throughout the entire book. And I mean, sprinkled in the jokes. It's sprinkled into the interactions with the, you know, the cat or the whatever. So it was, like you said, it's not flowery in a, like a, pretentious or like annoying way it is <clears throat> it's just really it's very concise in the way that uh it explores that depth and it like leads you to like with all these open-ended like cliffhangers almost to let your mind wander into something all right well uh this is where we put the book back on the shelf and we will um be reading the next book is going to be among others by joe walton We'll be reading up to the start of the entry for Wednesday, the 12th of December. It's written like journal entries. Oh, that makes a there's lot no more chapter. sense. <laughs> yeah, there's no chapters in this book. Okay. It's written as journal entries. So we're dates. reading up to page 151. All right. And uh, I've never seen this book before, and I don't, I'm, I'm like. I have no concept of this book. Yeah. I, so that's going to be interesting. Who picked this? Chris, I think you picked this book, right? No. Like somebody. Oh, okay. It just, it's a mystery it just, book. It just showed up on our list. We're like, oh, okay. All right. so, well, I guess we're reading that one. Yeah. So this is actually really exciting because I feel like most of these books and we've, we've had some sort of idea. At least one person in our group has had some sort of idea of what it's going to be about. So this is going to be a complete surprise for all of us. I don't even know who the target audience is. Is it young adult? Is it adult? I have no clue. I'm going to laugh if it's a ghost story because we're all <laughs> looking at each other like, who put this on the list? I'm it's, sure it's great and I'm yeah. sure it's there for a reason. It, I'm it, just... It's going to be something. I know. Yeah. I have no idea. But anyway, <laughs> it's um, a manuscript. Yeah. Uh, so, buddy read with us on Goodreads and Instagram at Dog Eared Discourse or view our reading schedule for the year on our website, dogeardiscourse.com. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. 